recording and okay welcome in today's class we are going to look at the design procedure for worm and worm wheel so the most important thing about worm and worm wheel is the axes are perpendicular to each other and they are non intersecting and they are out of plane so what you have is you have a worm and this worm is similar to a power screw so it's going to have threads and this worm is going to rotate and you are going to have a wheel so this is going to be worm and worm wheel the basic design principles that we study for gear design they are similar but the most important relationship that i want you to remember you should always remember that the velocity ratio which is also called as vr is given as number of teeth on the wheel divided by number of starts on the worm so tg is number of teeth on wheel and n is equal to number of starts on worm this is not uh, like the spur gear or helical gear where you have teeth on the driven gear and teeth on the driving gear they they are used to find out the velocity ratio if the worm has more number of starts then typically you are going to have a higher velocity ratio and i just want to give you an idea and this is again given in the table if you have a velocity ratio then what are the typical number of starts so for an example if your velocity ratio is above 36 then customarily you use one single start worm if the velocity ratio is between 12 to 36 it's a double start worm if 8 to 12 it's a triple start worm if 6 to 12 it's a four start worm and if it's four to 10 it's a six start worm so worm and worm wheel if you are going to have a very high reduction ratio which is commonly used then you are going to have single start wheel now next thing which i want to talk about is what are important proportions for the worm and the worm wheel so just like all other gear designs we are interested in finding out the principal dimensions of worm and worm wheel so what are the important dimensions so there is pressure angle typically pressure angle can go anywhere between 14 and half to 20 degrees so if you have a single so single or double started which means these guys over here it's typically 14 and half if you have the worm that is multi start starting from 3 4 and 5 the pressure angle is usually 
20 now there is there are different ways a verb can be cut i want you to visualize have this and what i want to do is i cut so what i could can cut thread on the shifts so what i can do is gear i would wear a shaft shaft cause it use torsion and then start cutting the threads exactly like the way you cut threads for the screws and in that case the worm is integral to the shaft now there is another way this is done is in certain cases you want worm to be made up with different material then what you have is you have a shaft so you have a shaft and what you do is you basically press fit or interference fit some type of fit depending upon application you use and you have the worm the threads and you have the shaft so this is called as integral and this is called as separate so now if you see the pitch circle diameter for worm when it is integral is different and pitch circle diameter for worm when it is separate it's slightly different so typically the ratios are 2.35 circular pitch plus 10 millimeters of clearance and when a worm is separate from the shaft typically you add additional clearance which is 2.4 times pc plus about 28 to 30 mm so 28 mm and you use the same dimensions for here so same dimensions then it's higher stuff another important dimension that i want you to notice is addendum addendum in the case of worm it is usually 0 0.3 times circular pitch and if the the worm is multi start starting from 3 4 5 6 then it is typically uh, 0 0.2 8 times pc one more important thing is face width and typically face width is considered as 4.5 times pc plus some clearance so another important dimension that you want to keep in mind is face width and that face width is equal to 4.5 times PC plus clearance. And depending upon what design textbook you use, you will see the values of clearance changing. And for an example, if you refer the textbook that we are using, Kurmi Gupta, they give you this relationship 4.5 plus. 0.02 TW. But again, that is totally depends upon uh, the, the design book that you use. Now, one thing, one important relationship that I want you to understand is the, the PCD of work when the center distance is specified. Why is this important? 
So many a times, if you have to design worm and worm wheel, the important requirement or important design requirement is the distance between these two center lines. So this distance is an important design parameter. So this is X. So PCD of worm is DW is equal to X 0 0.875 divided by 1.416. And it is important to note the value of X, which is the center distance should be in millimeter. So many a times you will have the center distance as one of the constraints because worm and worm wheel that they need to fit in particular configuration. You don't have a lot of space available and because of the space constraints, uh, they, the center distance is given to us. The other thing, and that this is an important relationship that I want you to remember. Oops. Another important relationship that I want you to remember is the PC is actually circular pitch. DW, which is the diameter of the worm. You can assume diameter of the worm, DW, in terms of the, the circular pitch. Now, when you cut worm, uh, cutting worm is a slightly different process than cutting the spur gear or helical gear. So I would encourage you to watch. So watch a YouTube video. Watch worm gear cutting video. Because you will notice that the procedure for cutting a worm gear is slightly different from the, the, the spur gear or the helical gear. Now, similar to worm, we have, so we talked about worm. We looked at the important relationships for worm. Now we have wheel, which is also called as worm wheel. So for worm wheel, the pressure angle needs to remain the same for worm wheel or just wheel, the pressure angle needs to remain the same. Whatever is the pressure angle for worm has to be the pressure angle for wheel. And in that case, what you have is you have outside diameter, which is called as DOG is equal to DG plus 1.01 .01 circular pitch. Then you also have the face width And that face width is 2.38 uh, times PC. And you can have additional uh, requirements or additional uh, specifications on the throat diameter and other stuff. But those are not typically used when we look at the basic engineering design. Once we have the preliminary uh, dimensions of the worm and worm wheel, once we know the addendum, once we know the circular pitch, we can move on 
and then find out all other dimensions. So these proportions, all the proportions are given in the textbook. So I would encourage you to refer to following tables, table 31.3 for worm and table 31.4 for V. And we will we'll work out few problems. And once we work out the problems, we'll know that how to use these tables for reference. Now, next thing, what I wanna talk about, and specifically it is important in the context of worm, worm wheel is the efficiency of gearing. So efficiency of gearing, efficiency is equal to tan lambda cosine phi minus mu tan lambda divided by cosine phi tan lambda plus mu, where mu is the coefficient of friction, mu coefficient of friction, phi is normal pressure angle and lambda is equal to lead angle. And worm and worm wheel, uh, when you select the materials, you would wanna uh, use the appropriate value of the coefficient of friction. If you look at the coefficient of friction, the coefficient of friction is dependent on the speed of the gearing. So, so what happens is typically when you, so what I'm gonna show you here, an approximate relationship between mu and N. So what happens is when you start, when you start, your speed is zero. So the coefficient of friction is usually quite high. As speed increases, the coefficient of friction drops down. And after some time, you will notice coefficient of friction gradually start increasing. And this phenomenon is observed because of multiple reasons. So if you consider two regions, I'm just gonna give you a basic explanation. Uh, you can study why the coefficient of friction curve is something like this. It also depends upon uh, the dimensional analysis, Reynolds number and so on. But what happens here is the lubrication is not well circulated because when the gear starts moving, then it actually imparts some kinetic energy to the surrounding lubricating oil and that increase in kinetic energy allows that lubricating oil to penetrate deeper and at the interface where the gearings, uh, gearing is, is, work, uh, is getting mesh. Now, what happens then is at this sweet spot, the speed is just right to, so to increase the temperature of the lubricant and the viscosity of the lubricant is correct. And then basically the lubrication is not sort of sticking to the surface. It's not actually resisting the motion. So lubrication is doing what it's supposed to do, lubricate and heat dissipate. Now what happens is as speed starts increasing, imagine you are in this region, this very high region. So as speed starts increasing, the kinetic energy of the lubricant is so high is that lubricant rather than sticking and staying at one place, 
it kind of moves around what it means it is doing an excellent job at heat dissipation but since the lubricant is not sticking where the interface is taking place the the actual lubrication drops down so the so the coefficient of friction increases another thing that you would notice at high speed uh, it may affect the viscosity of some lubricants so when the lubrication is at high speed sometimes some lubricants the viscosity it's affected the uh, the effect in viscosity results into um, a less lubrication and less uh, heat dissipation characteristics and so what you want to do is you want to maintain or you want to select a lubricant that is in between uh, it can optimally operate in between the the region of speed where your gearing is uh, uh, designed for operation so as there are some guidelines on what values of mu you should take and again these guidelines come from uh, thumb rules experimental analysis in certain cases the the higher order cfd type of analysis uh, in tribology so i will just give you some ideas typically the value of mu is considered 0.015 when the speed vr and this is called as the rubbing speed which is pi dw nw divided by cosine lambda is about 100 to 165 minute meter per minute and please note this coefficient of friction is quite small and the reason for that is you don't want your system to run dry you want you want to have lubricants you want to have you want your system to be continuously lubricated now for some reasons uh if you don't know a priori that what is the speed at which the the system is going to operate my recommendation to you is you can use this value as a conservative value so i would say that if speeds are not exactly known assume mu is equal to 0.015 and uh, one thing that we talked about uh, efficiency if the efficiency is less than 50% then the worm worm wheel is called self locking and this self locking property is desired in the case of hoisting machines or lifts lifts elevators so that the load on its own does not drive the motor now how do we design the system and design procedure is exactly same as the spur gear all the or the helical gear so we are going to use the lewis's form factor we are going to find out the velocity factor and so on so design process so how you design design of worm worm b so in this case first and foremost find out the tangential load
and this tangential load is found out by the same equation torque divided by the radius and this wt is given as sigma o which is the allowable stress multiplied by the velocity factor multiplied by the face width b multiplied by pi multiplied by m and multiplied by y which is the lewis's form factor and interesting enough uh, we would use the same relationship what we used to find out uh, the values of cv so interesting to note that the cv factor which is the velocity factor is given as 6 divided by 6 plus b and the lewis's form factor which is value of y which is can be found out using the same expression for per gear which is 0.124 minus 0.684 divided by tg one important thing is these are number of teeth on the wheel and this is the expression when your pressure angle is 14 and 1/2 degrees and y is equal to 0.154 minus 0.912 divided by tg for 20 degrees so again all the equations will remain the same and we will look at the design data book to find the value of allowable stress and then one thing that you want to notice is worm gears this is super important or worm wheel or wheel is always weaker than worm what does that mean it means it saves one step so whenever we design the spur gear we have the the gear and the pinion and we want to find out which one is weaker in the case of worm worm wheel we know the wheel is always going to be weaker so we will always design the wheel and once we have the wheel dimensions then we will actually go on and find out the values for the worm so that makes our life a little bit easy so moving on we found out the tangential load in this tangential load sig allowable stress would be known cv will be known b will be expressed in terms of m so expressed in terms of m or pc then you have m this is part of the expression on uh, the variable that we want to find out and the y is known so this guy is known this guy is known this guy is known in terms of b pi is known value of y is known so when we solve this we should be able to get the answer for pc or m is equal to 1 now the next step is we have to find out the dynamic load so in next step step 2 we have to find dynamic load and i'm going to call dynamic load is wd and interestingly 
the dynamic load for uh, basically worm and worm wheel if you think about it worm is rotating super fast i mean the gear ratios are quite high 3264 worm is rotating super fast and worm is like a solid shaft if you think about it is super duper strong so the the weaker element is the wheel but usually uh if you look at the the rotation speed of the wheel wheel is going to rotate significantly uh at lower rpm so uh rpm of wheel will be significantly lower than rpm of worm and what is the implication of this that means the dynamic load will be low so if you follow some design data books or if you follow some uh, uh, design uh, rules Uh, no they don't find dynamic load for the worm uh, wheel so but if we want to find out the dynamic load here is an approximate expression for the dynamic load wd is equal to wt divided by cv and this cv is nothing but the velocity factor and the reason this velocity factor comes in the picture is to give an uh, approximate answer for the dynamic load but in in reality you will notice that this dynamic load is not going to be causing a significant failure or it won't be the cause of failure for the worm uh, worm gear and when i say worm gear it i, I simply means v so so just notice worm gear or wheel or worm wheel means this and this guy is always referred as just worm so if you read the book and if they say worm gear most likely what they mean is the v okay so moving on to the next part uh, we have to check though for the static load so checking for static load and static load ws every the equation is going to remain the same except we will not have velocity factor and instead of sigma o we will use sigma e and sigma e multiplied by b multiplied by pi multiplied by m multiplied by y will give you this answer sigma e is flexural endurance limit and flexural endurance limit you can take at 84 newton per millimeter square all the way to 168 newton per millimeter square depending upon what material you choose but the good news is in the case of worm wheel typically two materials are very commonly used one is cast iron so you could have a cast iron wheel so this could be made with cast iron or you could use prosper bronze or you can use prosper bronze so these two types of material are commonly used 
in this particular application. So you can choose uh, sigma e is equal to 84, or you can choose sigma e is equal to 168. And I just need to clarify once again that this flexural endurance limit is inside the material. So this is the property of the core material. It's not the property of the surface. So basically, depending upon what material you choose, depending upon what type of heat treatment you do, not the surface heat treatment, the complete heat treatment you do, uh, this uh, endurance limit is different. Now, let's talk about the, the wear loading on the worm uh, uh, gear. So you just want to find out the value of WW, which is the wear load. So wear load, which is given as WW is DG multiplied by B multiplied by K, where DG is the diameter diameter of worm gear and then B is the face width and K is the load stress factor. So and again, the load stress factor for different combinations of material is different. So this is the difference between the worm gear design and the spur gear design. So please understand, depending upon the material that is chosen for worm and the material that is chosen from worm wheel, the load stress factor K is going to be different. So for an example, if your verb is made up with steel, and if your is phosphor bronze, then the load stress factor and the unit for load stress factor is Newton per millimeter square is given in terms of 0 0.415. If you were to choose a hardened steel and cast iron, so hardened, steel and cast iron, then your load factor is 0 0.345. So depending upon what combinations you choose, you have different values of this factor. So I would encourage you to look at uh, the table 31.5 from the text to get the values of K. So we are going to refer to this uh, uh, table to find out the appropriate values. Now, this, the thing that is different in worm gear design is we need to look at the heat dissipation. So thermal dissipation. So we need to perform thermal analysis. And what do I mean by thermal analysis? So once you have a worm and worm wheel. Worm and worm wheel drives are not as efficient as per gear. So what's gonna happen is it with the pair would have some efficiency. This efficiency, as you can see, could go as low as less than 50%. So for the sake of discussion, let me see that, let me just state that the efficiency of this particular configuration worm and worm wheel drive is 40%. So efficiency of this power transmission is 40%. What that means is uh, I'm losing, so loss is equal to one minus efficiency multiplied by power transmitted. So 
so which means about 60% of the power is lost in heat so this is the heat so what it means is the oil that you have surrounding this pairing so this oil this oil that needs to dissipate this heat and then basically when this oil comes in contact with the casing when this oil comes in contact with the casing <clears throat> that heat is transferred to the casing and depending upon the design whether it is free convection or force convection what you have is you have fins or you could have a fan and or sometimes you may have some sort of oil cooler that will cool the oil now so one thing that we want to see here is if this casing if this casing is capable of dissipating heat now what does that mean so think about it like if you have this so let me give you an example so you have this casing you have this casing and this casing is continuously heated this casing is continuously heated at some point this casing should get in thermal equilibrium with the surrounding so this is the surrounding and if you follow the concept of thermodynamics this is my system and this is my boundary so what's going to happen is the heat will cross this boundary and get dissipated into surrounding so it stuck it at certain point the temperature should stabilize which means whatever is the heat generated by the system that additional heat should be passed on to the surrounding maintaining constant temperature of the system you don't want this system temperature to continuously increase so what should happen is you would have this a which is the area multiplied by delta t multiplied by the heat dissipation coefficient k that gives you the q dissipated so this is heat generated and this is heat dissipated at some point the heat generated q generated should be equal to q dissipated uh, if this does not happen then what it means is there is always unsteady heat transfer taking place and temperature of the system is continuously increasing and what we want to make sure at that thermal equilibrium when heat generated is equal to heat dissipated this system this boundary is not too hot when i say too hot what i mean by that is if you touch it you may feel it's hot but it's not melting the the material or it's not melting the metal or it is not affecting the property of the lubricant so there is some heat there is some change in the temperature temperature has increased but that temp increase in temperature is not so severe to affect the operation of the system and that is what that we need to check and what we do for that is typically typically the value of k depends upon the the type of cooling system that you have if you have the forced cooling clearly the value of k will be significantly higher 
if you have the free cooling or free convection, the value is significantly lower. So typically, the value of K is taken as 378 watt per meter square degree Celsius. This is an approximate value. This is approximate value. And this value is considered just as a guideline. And A is the area of housing. So I need to say here, A is the area of housing. Now, something important is how do we find out area of housing? And at this point, what we are trying to see is we are trying to see approximate change in the temperature. So at that point, you can approximate the housing area is you can consider the diameter of the wheel. So you can consider the diameter of the wheel. You can find out the value of area. Assuming you have casing on the either side, multiply that by two times. You can find out the diameter of worm. Then you can find out the surface area of the worm and add some clearance and that gives you the value of A. So I'm gonna give you the housing area approximate expression is two times area of wheel plus surface area of work. This is an approximate expression. So the housing area is two times the area of the wheel. And this expression, you want to substitute here. And everything is known. So we can find out the change in temperature and then just make sure that the change in the temperature is well within the reasonable limits of the lubrication capacity as well as the handling capacity. Because sometimes what happens is worm and worm wheel are used close proximity to where humans are working. So in that particular case, what you want to make sure is the temperature is not so high. So by some accident, if human gets in contact with the housing, you don't want him to burn. Alternatively, sometimes you have worm and worm wheel they are, they are working or they are, they are used in uh, the environment which uh, has some volatile gases or organic compounds. So you wanna make sure that the temperature of housing is not high to cause self-ignition of the mixture of gases. And that could very well happen in certain power transmission uh, uh, equipment. So you want to be considerate Again, depending upon what the application is, there are additional criteria. In certain cases, when the gearings are used in oil and gas industry, you have additional specifications on temperatures and additional specifications on operations. So because you don't want uh, the temperature to be high, just so that it cause some sort of flashing or some sort of spark, so depending upon the industry that you use, sometimes the worm, worm wheel is used uh, in applications for pump applications uh, and pumping some liquids that are temperature sensitive. So you want to make sure that you don't want to use worm, worm wheel in such an application, which is temperature sensitive, that changes the temperature of the pump and that changes the temperature of the liquid that is being pumped and that affects the overall uh, performance of that, that fluid. So there are additional guidelines depending upon what industry you work in and those guidelines we will follow. So the last part is we want to talk about what are the different types of forces acting on this worm and worm wheel. And once again, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna draw two figures. So first figure 
is the front view. And the second figure is the side view. So this is the front view and this is the side view. So when you look at the front view, you are gonna have a radial load. So this is gonna be WR. Same load will be visible in the side view. So you're gonna have WR. This is the radial load that is acting on the world. Now, let me show you you are going to have, and this is an in interesting concept, and I want you to understand this very, very carefully. For, for worm to rotate, for worm to rotate, you are going to have a tangential load. This is WT on worm that causes worm to rotate. Now this tangential load acts in the axial direction on the wheel. So W A. So I want you to understand this very carefully. So what happens is you're gonna have the tangential load and that is actually going to act on the wheel. So if you look at the worm, worm wheel relationships, First and foremost, let me show you the value of WT. WT is a torque divided by PCD of the worm. And when I say PCD of the worm, I mean by this, this is the PCD of worm. divided by two, that gives you the value of T. Then the axial force, WA, this is on worm. The axial force on worm is WT divided by tan, so tan lambda. So this axial force on worm is nothing but tangential load on wheel. So this is super important. Axial load on worm is actually becoming tangential load on the wheel. And the radial, the last part is radial load is given as WA multiplied by tan uh, C. This is, so this is the tangential load. Now please note, this tangential load is tangential load on worm. This is the radial load on worm. So as you can see, worm, worm wheel, they have this sort of interchangeable relationship. So if you look at the axial load on worm, uh, the axial load on the worm is actually causing the tangential load on wheel because this axial load on the worm is making that wheel rotate and these things we have to take into account when we design the shaft. Uh, so any questions about the design process so far? Any questions about the design process?
and one thing i just want to uh, tell you that uh, if you look at your steering mechanism so power steering mechanism uh, many a times they have worm worm wheel so sometimes they say the steering uh, is uh, uh, i mean uh, its gearing is worn at that time most likely either your worm is worn out or the clearance has increased and uh, the steering slips and in addition to worm worm wheel you are uh, typically have a power steering that boost uh, the force uh, but worm worm wheel i have seen that is that being used for power steering applications okay any questions now if uh, if there are no questions i would like to take an example so let's work out worm worm wheel example and uh, many a in these problems have different type of flavors so just one additional relationship that i just want to tell you and just want to uh, give you some sort of guidelines and these are some guidelines to keep in mind so whenever you are trying to design the worm worm wheel most of the times you want to maintain the center distance and this center distance can be expressed in terms of the lead and the the velocity ratio so in that case one useful relationship and i'm not going to derive this but i'm just going to state it is 2 pi cot of lambda plus velocity ratio and these values l is equal to nothing but axial lead and axial lead as probably you know is normal lead divided by cosine of so ln divided by cosine of uh, lambda and so lambda is equal to the lead angle and vr is the velocity so this information can be used to find out the appropriate values of uh, the the lead or the ratio between x and l and that information may be used to solve the problem and what does that mean what it means is for the most efficient power transmission so usually one relationship is velocity ratio is equal to cot q of lambda so this relationship this is a guideline that we can keep in mind where would this be used so so let me state a problem you have a problem in this problem say the velocity ratio is given the velocity ratio is given and at that time the first step is we need to find out the lead angle because it's a power speed so what, what what would be the value of lead angle you would take so you can choose the the value of lead angle that is given in the the table in the design data book for the worm and worm wheel so you can actually say that uh my lead angle may be 15 degrees or 20 degrees but if you want your design to be optimal 
then if the velocity ratio is given, I would just use the relationship velocity ratio is equal to cot cube lambda and find out the value of lambda and that would be the, the appropriate lead angle. So here we have option. So one option is I can choose the lead angle, choose lead angle between say 10 degrees to 50 degrees and then continue with the design. But what that tells you is that does not give you the optimal uh, relationship between the center distance and the lead. So if you find out the appropriate lead angle, then from that lead angle, you have to find out the axial lead. From that axial lead, you have to make sure that you are within the center distance requirements and so on. So alternatively, what you can say is, you can say for optimal uh, power transmission, you are going to assume the velocity ratio is equal to cot cube lambda and find out the value of lambda. And that is sometimes very useful because that may save additional steps. So, so if you say choose a lead angle, what I need to do next is center distance is a given. Then I have to find out the value of ln cosine lambda divided by two pi cot lambda plus velocity ratio. So this guy is given, this guy is given. Now I need to come up with some value for ln and cosine lambda. So to find out the value of ln, I need to go back and look at the recommended values of ln. So what is the value of uh, so uh, normal lead? And then I can find out the value of cosine lambda. So which means at this point, I'm left with two unknowns. And there is some trial and error that is required. But if it is not given, then I can actually use this relationship and then directly get the answer and say that I'm, I want my gear, de gear design to be optimal and I'm going to use the relationship. Velocity ratio is equal to cot cube lambda and then solve the problem. Okay, so this is one guideline uh, that may come very, that may come out handy when you work out the problem. And, and let me work out the problem and it will be clear. So let me look at a worm gear design problem. So let's say in this problem, we are designing worm and worm wheel. for 20 degrees in volume. And power transmission P is equal to 10 kilowatts. And the worm rotating at 1400 RPM. And the speed reduction or the velocity ratio is equal to 12 to 1. And this 12 to 1 ratio is achieved with just uh, one gearing. And at the same time, distance between shafts is equal to 225 millimeters. So this is a classic problem wherein velocity ratio is specified and at the same time, the distance between the shafts 
is also specified. So first and foremost, we will start with design of worm. And in worm and worm wheel design, there is little bit of back and forth you have to do. So I will explain that when I look at, um, when I solve this problem. Because unlike the spur gear, the pinion is a, a sort of a replica of the gear, only it's proportionally smaller. In the case of worm and worm wheel, the wheel is a different gear design and worm is a different gear design. Worm is like actually a screw. It's not a gear per se. And wheel is actually a gear. So, so let's design, design of worm. So step one is since the velocity ratio is given to us, I'm going to use velocity ratio is equal to cot lead angle q and the velocity ratio here is 12 is equal to cot lambda q and that gives me the value of lambda is equal to 23.6 degrees and once we have this lambda which is 23.6 degrees what I need to do is I need to find out the value of normal lead. So X is equal to LN divided by two pi. And if you look at this equation, cosine alpha, sorry, cosine lambda in the parentheses, cot lambda, plus VR. So X is given as 225 LN divided by two pi cosine of 23.6 cot of 23.6 plus the velocity ratio which is 12. And here, the only unknown is LN. And to find LN, you just plug in the values in this equation and you will find LN value to be 90 millimeter. So once LN is known, we have to find L, which is in the axial direction, which is 90 divided by cosine of lambda that gives me about 98 millimeter. And now once we know this value, we can proceed with other design parameters. Now let's look at the velocity ratio 12. So we looked at when the velocity ratio is 12, this is something I want you to observe. You can actually have a double start worm or you could have a triple start worm, or if you want to be courageous, you can have a four start worm. So nobody has stopped you from using a double start worm or triple start worm or quadruple start worm. So you have a choice. So you can actually choose the, the whatever uh, number of starts that makes sense. But in this problem, I'm just gonna use four start worm. So for velocity ratio is equal to 12 using four start worm, which is N is equal to four. And that can be used to find out the, the axial pitch of the threads because now I have four starts. So when I have four starts, PA axial pitch is equal to L divided by four. And please note, L is axial lead. And, and I think I should kind of draw the figure and explain what do I mean by axial lead. So I want you to think of uh, the worm as the power screw. 
so so this is the axial leaf and now since we have four start worm the axial leaf is going to be i mean uh, the the axial uh, pitch this is the axial pitch is equal to lead divided by number of start so and let me write this equation down axial pitch is equal to axial lead divided by number of starts so l is equal to 98 that comes from here divided by 4 that gives me the value of, of is 24 millimeter and once i know the axial pitch i can find out the value of module please note pi times module is axial pitch so module is equal to pa which is 24 divided by pi that gives me the module and you will notice your module will be approximately 8 millimeters so you can find out the value of pa which is about 25 millimeters and that will give you value of ln and that will give you value of la now at this point you might want to check the center distance so checking for center distance Now, some of you may ask me, why is this step needed? This step is needed because this is an approximate value. And this approximation carries forward. So if you were to use the math uh, calculator, you may notice that your value is 7.8 or 7.9, but we approximated it or rounded it off to the higher side. And this approximation could potentially change the center distance. So we want to see how far is this center distance change from the design center distance. Okay, 7.15, I'm gonna stop recording. So in this particular problem, what we want to do is we want to check for center distance. And since we are making some approximations, we just want to make sure that the original center distance constraint is not violated significantly. And there are additional measures that you can take to account for the slight variation in the center distance. And whenever you have, so let me give you a simple example. Imagine that you have a worm and worm wheel drive And the requirement on the center distance is say 200 and let's take this example. The requirement on center distance is about 225 millimeter. But in actual practice, it may not be possible to maintain this exact center distance. So what can happen is you can add couplings. So for an example, this worm is attached to say a motor. And then you can add some sort of a coupling that can accommodate slight misalignment. If you have this wheel, you can add some coupling that would, al that would allow for slight misalignment. And that way you compensate for the error in the center distance. So error in center distance. 
So, but it's it's a good idea to check for the center distance. And the equation for the center distance is x divided by ln is equal to one divided by two pi. One divided by sine lambda plus vr divided by cosine lambda. At this point, you may ask, wow, where is this equation coming from? This equation is coming from the equation for center distance that we saw a moment ago. So I just took this cosine lambda inside. Cot is uh, cosine divided by sine. I just took this cosine quantity inside and then I lined up with this expression. So I would recommend that you can actually uh, check this center distance and you will notice this center distance is approximately 225 millimeter. You will notice it's somewhere in between 225.8 and nine, but that is good enough. Next thing is tan of lambda is equal to L divided by pi times dw. dw is nothing but the diameter of the worm. This is the pitch circle diameter of the worm. So dw is the pitch pitch circle diameter of worm. So I'm gonna substitute the value of L. L is nothing but axial lead. And axial lead is nothing but PA, which is the axial pitch that we got over here, multiplied by number of starts. So PA, we know, uh, which is 25 times number of starts, four, which is 100. So tan of 23.6 is equal to L, which is 100, divided by pi, times dw. So dw is equal to 74 millimeter. This is the diameter of pearl. So at this point, we have enough information for the worm. So we can find out the other dimensions, which are non-critical dimensions for the worm and we can also find out number of teeth teeth on wheel remember velocity ratio is equal to number of teeth on wheel which is tg divided by number of starts on worm So velocity ratio is 12 to so Tg. Number of start is four. So I have Tg is equal to 48. And I would like to spend a minute on this discussion here. So unlike the, the gear design, where you decide the number of teeth on the pinion, and then you can find out the number of teeth on the gear. What you need to decide is number of start on the worm. And please note, these two things are interdependent. So velocity ratio dictates what, how many number of starts 
you should use. So for an example, in this particular problem, the velocity ratio was 12. So we had an option. We can choose two star, three star, or four star. But we made a choice. We used four star. And at that point, we pretty much decided the number of teeth on V. So this step is sort of automatic. The next step, what we need to do is we have to find out the face length of the world. So what is this concept of face length? Face length is how long this actual worm is, where the threads are cut. So this is given as LW. So, and then this is just the shaft. This is not cut. So this is actual worm, LW. And you can look at the table 31.3. So this comes from table 31.3 from the text. And you will notice it is PC 4.5 plus 0 0.02 TW, which is nothing but number of starts on the word or N. So PC is 25.1, 4.5, plus 0 0.02 multiplied by four. This is the clearance. So that gives you about 115 millimeter. Now, again, we need to understand that when you are going to cut, you are not gonna have an accurate LW as 115. You are gonna have the cutter that is going to generate some feed marks over here, some feed marks over here. So which is actually when the cutter is going to start cutting, it's not going to cut the actual thread or the complete thread. So what you wanna do is you want to add some clearance for feed marks. So this is the clearance. So this is clearance. for cutter feed marks. And think about it is like sort of half thread. So you don't have the complete thread, but you have threads that are partially cut at the beginning when the cutter is entering and when the cutter is leaving. So to compensate for the feed marks, I'm gonna add maybe about uh, uh, 25 millimeter of clearance, this is approximate. So 115 plus 25 approximate clearance. And that gives me the total length as 140 millimeter. And then using the same table 31.1, I can find out the value of H, which is the depth of tooth, which is 0 0.6 times PC, about 16 millimeter. You can find out the addendum. That is 0 0.2 times PC. That gives you about eight millimeter. And then you can find out the outside diameter that is DW, which is the diameter of the worm plus two times the addendum. So that is about 88 millimeter. So these are the major dimensions. And this table, table 31.3, can be used to find all these additional dimensions. So at this point, the worm is completely designed. Now, move on to the V or the design of worm gear.
so design of worm gear or wheel so first and foremost lot of the information that is needed to design the wheel is already found out so first thing to understand that the pressure angle for the worm and pressure angle for the wheel is going to be the same module for the worm and the module for the wheel is going to remain the same so this is something to know pressure angle for worm and wheel is same module for worm and wheel is same so what it means is the diameter of the gear diameter of the worm gear is module times number of teeth this is the same relation that we used when we designed the spur gears so 8 multiplied by 48 that gives me 384 millimeter then outside diameter is dg plus 0 0.8 tc that gives you about 406 millimeter and the face width b is 2.15 times pc and please note these values can be obtained as we discussed earlier in this lesson and from table 31.4 so this gives me about 59 millimeter so these are all the important dimensions with that we are ready to move forward to find out the value of the tangential load. So WT, to find tangential load, what we need to do is, we need to find out the value of torque divided by D by two. So look at the velocity ratio. Velocity ratio is 12, which is nothing but 1400 divided by the velocity uh, or the speed of the wheel. So from here, N wheel is about 116 RPM. So torque P is equal to 2 pi N T divided by 60. The torque is going to remain constant. So we have uh, the, the, sorry, the power is going to remain constant. Depending upon the speed, the torque is going to be different. So power is 10 kilowatts is equal to two times pi times N times T divided by 60. That gives me the value of T which is 818 Newton meter. And the tangential load will be 818 divided by this dimension, 384. And this needs to be converted to meters by two. So that gives me, Four two six zero and with this we can find out the value of the pitch line velocity so p t which is the pitch line velocity it's pi times diameter of the gear multiplied by the speed divided by 60 pi times 384 
again converting that to meters times 116 divided by 60 that gives me 2.35 meters per second and with this we can find out the velocity factor 6 6 plus v 6 6 plus 2.35 0 0.72 and that is the value of the velocity factor truth form factor for the 20 degree involute because that is how the gear is 0 0.154 minus 0 0.912 divided by tg and please note all these steps they have to be carried out for the wheel not for the work. So that is 0 0.154 minus 0 0.912 divided by 48. That gives me 0 0.135. And we are going to assume, assuming V is made of prosper bronze sigma o is 84 newton per millimeter square wt is equal to Sigma O times, so let me write the equation first. Sigma O CV B times pi times M times Y. Sigma O is 84, 0 0.72. B, value of B is known. Pi times eight times y, which is zero point one three five. So this is the capacity of the system, so which is twelve point one kilonewton. So this is the max possible. WT that can be withstood by gear. And this is significantly greater than the actual tangential stress, tangential load, which is 4260. So design is safe. Next step is we have to check for the dynamic load. Again, this step is not required, but just in case. Is equal to WD, WT divided by CV. So, 12.1 divided by 0 0.72. So 16.8 kilonewton. Again, this is the capacity. This is greater than 4260. Hence, it is safe. But this is not required actually. Not required. Then check for static endurance load or static load
So you can use sigma E for crosser bonds, 168 Newton per millimeter square, and WS is equal to sigma E times B times pi times M times Y, 168 times 59 pi times eight times 0 0.135. And that answer is 33.635 Newton. So again, this is much, much greater than four to six zero, but the design is safe. Last but not least is check for wear. So assuming, so at this point, we have to assume worm is made with steel K is equal to 0 0.55. Following the equations that we talked about, WW is equal to DG times B times K. And that value is 384, which is the diameter of the wheel times 59 times 0 0.55. And that gives you 12.4 kilonewton. This is again, greater than 4 to 6 zero. The design is safe. Now the last part is we need to look for the heat dissipation. To check for heat dissipation, we find you need to find the rubbing velocity. And then find out the value of mu. Alternatively, we can take the value of mu as 0 0.015 and carry out the calculations. So, I can find out the value of phi, which is tan inverse 0 0.015, which is approximately two degrees. Then efficiency is equal to tan lambda divided by tan lambda plus phi. Lambda is 23.6 divided by tan 23.6 plus two. That gives me about, about 0 0.89, which means the heat generated is equal to one minus efficiency multiplied by power one minus 0 0.89 multiplied by power is uh, 10,000 or 10 kilowatts, approximately 1,200 kilowatts. Now we need to estimate the housing area. So approximate housing area is equal to two times area of wheel plus pi times diameter of worm 
multiplied by LW. And this is length of word. When you do that, uh, you will approximately get the area 120,000 millimeter square. This is approximate area. And you have to equate Q generated is equal to Q dissipated. And if you look at the Q generated, we already know the value 1200. Q dissipated is A times delta T times K. A is 120 and we need to convert that into milli, uh, meter square multiplied by delta T multiplied by 384. And from here, you would get delta T is equal to 30 degrees, approximately 30 degrees. So this change in the temperature is not very significant. So we would say the design is safe. So typically you want delta T to be less than equal to 50 degrees. Because if you assume the, the temperature, the surrounding temperature to be about 30 degrees, 40 degrees, so which means uh, your oil or lubricating oil with 50 degrees margin will get about 100 degrees. And that is a fairly good temperature for to oil to, uh, to work satisfactorily. Okay, any questions so far? The next step is design of worm shaft. So design of shafts. And the way we design the shafts for worm and worm wheel, the process is exactly similar as the design for the shafts for the gear you have to come up with, so you have to assume how this worm is balanced or, or located and supported. So typically the worm will be simply supported and you are going on the worm, you are going to have a radial load. You are going to have a tangential load and then you are gonna have an axial load. So what you need to do is, you need to find out the total moment because of the combined effect of these loads. Then you have to find out the torque. Then you have to find out the, the T equivalent, which is square root of M square plus T square. And then use the equation tau is equal to T divided by J multiplied by R and find out the design of shaft for the world. Same thing for the wheel, but in the case of wheel, please note the axial load on the, the worm becomes the tangential load on the wheel and you have the radial load and what you need to do is you need to find those values uh, and then find out the total moment. So, so find out the total moment, then find out the value of torque and then the find the value of TEQ m square plus t square and then use the exact same equation 
to find out the torque i mean the find out the shaft diameters for the worm and for the wheel so these are the overall steps and if you want to see the shaft design in detail uh, there are a couple of problems in the textbook where the shaft design is calculated or performed so i would encourage you to take a look at it okay uh, any questions on worm worm wheel design So, if there are no questions on worm and worm mill design, uh, good news is that we finish the gear design, and the next part that we are going to study is internal combustion engine, or also called as IC engine. So, design of internal. combustion engine so first and foremost let's understand what is the difference between an internal combustion engine and an external combustion engine so think about a steam engine so steam engine has a boiler and what happens is this high pressure high temperature steam enters the piston and cylinder assembly and then this piston and cylinder assembly rotates this crank and there is this inlet valve there is this exhaust valve and the steam that is spent by um, expanding goes to something called as the condenser and that is converted to water so condenser and in and then it go there will be a pump and then it will go back to boiler so in the boiler you are going to have combustion taking place so you can have some sort of heating element either you can use coal or you can use gas and that is where the heat is imparted to the working substance so in the boiler you have working substance say water you heat water water gets converted to steam initially the steam is saturated uh, then as you increase the temperature the steam gets superheated the superheated steam is completely dry and this dry steam which is at high temperature and high pressure that goes on to the inlet valve and this piston is pushed so the work is done and then after work is done the heat loses its energy and then that high pressure high temperature steam gets converted to maybe uh, uh, with some dryness fraction combination of water vapor and steam and that is exhausted in the condenser and in condenser you reject the remaining Uh, heat and that steam gets converted to water and then that water gets pumped so if you think about it this cycle is called as rankine cycle so steam engines work on something called as the rankine cycle now what are the advantages and disadvantages of steam engine or in general external combustion engine so this is external combustion so for external combustion engine you don't have strict requirement on fuel you don't have to use gasoline 
you can use natural gas you can use coal you can use wood or you can use whatever material that is available to generate heat whatever material that you can burn but on the other hand if you see the setup is super bulky and then sometimes you can have external combustion engine and try to make it somewhat mobile using uh, like using steam locomotives but still the setup is bulky now if you look at the working fluid the working fluid is continuously circulated sometimes what happens is the the exhaust can be sent out to atmosphere so for an example that usually happens in the case of some steam engines where once the steam is exhausted through exhaust wall the steam is sent out to atmosphere on the other hand if you look at the internal combustion engine what you have is you have the piston cylinder assembly you have the piston cylinder assembly you have connecting rod so you have connecting rod and then you have a crank so you have a connecting rod and then you have a crank so this piston goes back and forth so this is piston this is cylinder this is connecting rod and this is crank this is called as crankcase and here this area this is where the combustion takes place so i'm going to show you a spark ignition engine so it has a spark plug it has inlet valve it has exhaust valve it has intake manifold manifold is pipe and exhaust manifold so you have intake valve and you have exhaust valve now let's look at the the operation of a spark ignition engine so i'm going to call this internal combustion engine the ic engine is spark ignition so what happens is the air fuel mixture so air plus fuel so gasoline air plus fuel mixture comes through the intake valve and is introduced in the combustion chamber so this is the combustion chamber so what happens in combustion chamber is if you have a four stroke engine there are four strokes four strokes there are uh different types of internal combustion engine you can have a four stroke engine or you can have a two stroke engine you can have a gasoline engine or you can have a diesel engine and we will talk about it in the, the next section but at this point I, i want you to understand the functioning of internal combustion engine the combustion chamber is inside the engine so what happens is this air fuel ratio comes in you ignite this air fuel mixture by means of a spark plug and then what happens is these high temperature high pressure gases these push the piston down and then you have fly wheel that pushes the piston back up and then the exhaust valve kind of opens and all the spent gas is exhausted so once again 
if you have an a spark ignition engine the air fuel mixture that is ready to burn but it's not burning yet it's ready to burn is introduced to the intake manifold into the combustion chamber that is where the spark is initiated that air fuel mixture burns and it generates high temperature high pressure gases these high temperature high pressure gases work on the piston they push the piston down and then they they get exhausted just like steam they lose the energy and these spent gases so that that has lower temperature lower pressure that gets exhausted through the exhaust valve now this is the basic function of an internal combustion engine what are the major differences between the external combustion engine and the internal combustion engine if you look at internal combustion engine as it, the word says the combustion is internal internal combustion engines are compact and they are suitable more suitable for automotive applications but if you see internal combustion engine they are used for weed whackers they are used for lawn mowers they are used for generators so but these engines are compact what are the additional requirements on these internal combustion engine you have to be careful about the fuel you cannot burn kerosene or you can burn you cannot burn unpurified fuel inside the internal combustion engine because that would damage the engine again you have to be careful about the lubrication requirement so you have to make sure that since there are a lot of moving parts you the lubrication is appropriately circulated all the joints all the bearings or uh, part of the piston connecting rod gudgeon pin piston pin uh, they are all lubricated so there are additional requirements on lubrication but in general the 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 mechanism is more complicated compared to the external combustion engine and the applications are different for an example if you want to generate a very huge power then most likely you are going to use an external combustion engine that gives you flexibility of using multiple uh, different types of fuels comparing to the internal combustion engine where you are restricted to certain types of fuel so you cannot burn diesel in a spark ignition uh, or gasoline engine that will foul the spark plug as a matter of fact you cannot use gasoline in the the diesel uh, engine because the diesel engine do not have spark plugs they operate on a different principle so i just want you at this point to understand the difference between the external combustion engine and an internal combustion engine internal combustion engines do not operate on rankine cycle they operate on auto cycle diesel cycle or dual cycle so auto cycle is the cycle that is used for spark ignition si engines so spark ignition engines are called si engine diesel cycle and dual cycle are used for diesel engines diesel engines are called compression ignition engines so ci engines and in next in a moment i'll talk about the differences between the spark ignition engine and the compression uh, ignition engine so once you understand the difference between the external combustion and internal combustion let's try to see what types of internal combustion engines are there there are quite a few but we will try to study the most common internal combustion engines so types of ic engines
so it depends upon the the type of fuel So since there are gasoline engines and there are diesel engines. Gasoline engines need a spark plug. That's why they are called as spark ignition engine. The diesel engines do not need a spark plug. They purely, uh, the diesel fuel gets ignited just because of the compression. And we'll talk about it. So it do not need, a, so this is compression ignition. So that's why they are called CI engines. Then the next type is type or number of stroke. And you have two stroke engines. And you have four stroke engine. And I want to talk about this in a little bit detail. So any engine will have four uh, basic components of, uh, of cycle. So the cycle comprises of suction, compression, expansion, exhaust. So let me give you a schematic of engine. So the top of position of the piston is called as top dead center, TDC. And the bottom position of the piston is called as bottom dead center, which is called as BDC. 